Hi, and welcome to this video of Dynamics 365 talk, where I'll be discussing the 2020 release wave two features, which came out for early access on August 3rd of 2020. Now in the previous video, I discussed part one of the Dynamics 365 field service updates. And in this video, I'm going to cover part two of the updates in Dynamics 365 field service. But before we get started, let me introduce myself. My name is Dion Taylor and I'm a Microsoft Business Applications MVP. So feel free to check out my blog at d365goddess.com or follow me on Twitter at d365goddess or just connect with me on LinkedIn by scanning the QR code on your screen. All right, so what I'll be talking about today are the following enhancements, the usability enhancements. We're gonna talk a little bit about the uh, work order metrics, asset properties. We now have the ability to turn on the use of Power Automate for the field service workflows, enhanced skill matching, which is for RSO only, customer asset validations and related account reparenting, and then some additional enhancements also that were not available for the early access, but are still coming according to the Microsoft Docs website. All right, so let's start with some of the usability enhancements. So if you go to the docs.microsoft site, where all of these features are shown on that website, right? Everything that's available for 2020 release wave two, you'll see something that's called field service subgrids as a dialogue. So what that means is that some of these field service child records are going to be opened in a separate overlay window so that you know you, you're not really navigating away from the record that you're viewing. So for example, if you're working on a work order, right? I have a work order up here, then you can create and you can update and you can review related child records. So let's take a look at what that looks like. I'm just gonna go here to my tasks and products and services. These are my child records, right? Of the work order. So now if I click on this particular product, which is the heating regulator, you can see that it now opens in this overlay window, right? Which is pretty cool, I think, uh, because again, right? I'm not navigating away from that work order. When I'm done reviewing or updating, I can just go ahead and close out of that. And that just brings me back to this work order record that I was on previously. Now, if you don't like this feature for whatever reason, you can actually turn this off as well. So you just go here to service, Oops, I actually want to go here to from service to settings. And then I want to go ahead. Oops, I want to go open my field service settings, which I'm in currently. You're going to click on other and you can sh see here that it says work order subgrids records open as pop up. So if you turn that off, obviously you will get back to the old functionality. So there are several new fields that have been added to the work order entity, which addresses some of the previous gaps. And these fields allow for better tracking in the work order lifecycle. Now, if you actually go to the record log tab on the work order, you'll see the new fields that have been added. So the first one is total estimated duration. And obviously, right, as the name suggests, it calculates the total estimated duration but that is coming from related work order service tasks. So if you add an incident type and that incident type has work order service tasks, those will be added obviously here in that, what we saw earlier, let me click back here in the tasks area, that's what it's looking at. But not just if I'm adding those for incident types, also if I add one manually, that's also included in that total estimated duration. Now, the other thing that I noted is that if you have any existing work orders in your system, this is not going to get updated. However, if you're gonna go in and you edit any of those existing related work order service tasks, this actually will kick off that recalculation and it will update the field. 
I also thought it was kind of interesting that it's actually not looking at the related requirement records because, you know, you could have two people that are required. Do we then want the estimated duration to be double because we're taking two people's time or would they both work the two hours uh, and 15 minutes, right? It's, it's kind of, again, the field isn't on there. We can add it obviously ourselves as well. So it's not a big deal. Now, the second field that's been added is the first arrived on. And obviously that's just going to show the date and the time, but pay attention. This is only when the first booking is marked as arrived. So we all know you can have multiple bookings regarding a work order. So the first person who updates his booking or her booking as arrived, that's what's going to update this field. Next one is completed on similar situation. Right? It's going to be a date field. It's going to show the date and the time. This time though, it's going to be the last booking related to this work order that's been set to complete it, right? Because the first person might be ready. The second person is not done yet. So when the last person, the last booking is marked as completed, that's when this field is going to be date stamped. And then we have asset properties. So I really like this. I think this is really cool. It really, it allows us to create unique information for every individual customer asset that we track. So usually if you have different assets, you probably want to store different types of information, right? So let's take a look at that. Maybe if you have an HVAC unit, you're, you want to track the cooling capacity or whether or not a heater is included, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe if you have an elevator as a customer asset, you want to track what is the counterweight and what is the, does it have a car guide rail? Yes or no. Uh, what is the size of that? Like whatever, right? That's kind of what asset properties allow us to do. Now you might think, so that's basically the same thing as, as, as tracking different fields on customer assets, right? Because again, right, one, the HVAC unit, we want to track cooling capacity and heater included, yes or no. The other one, we want to track counterweight and car guide rail. Yes, it's kind of that concept, but we're not creating different fields. This is when we're using these asset properties. So let me show you how that works. So I'm just going to go here to the settings area. Here we go. And then I'm going to scroll down here and you can see here asset properties. So first we have property definitions and then we have templates for properties. So the first thing we're going to do is we're actually going to create these asset properties, which is really right. The properties or the type of information that we want to track. And again, some of these properties you can use on multiple properties, right? Regardless of what they are, like an HVAC unit and an elevator, let's say to make and a model, we could probably track for both. So this is kind of a decision that you need to make. When am I actually adding a field to the customer asset entity versus when am I using these asset properties? All right, so you just saw earlier that HVAC unit, we had two properties, cooling capacity and heater included. Let's now go and add one for the elevator. So I'm gonna say new and the property name is going to be counterweight because I wanna know what the counterweight is. So what you see over here is you can have different types of information, right? What do I want this property to be saved in? Is this gonna be a number, a string, a Boolean, or a date and time? Now this is gonna be a number because I'm looking for the counterweight and I'm gonna say this is gonna be in kilograms, right? Obviously again, however you wanna do this, this is just an example. So I'm gonna go ahead and save and close that. So I added the property now the next thing that I need to do is actually add it to my asset. So let's go take a look at customer assets. Oh, let's just go ahead and go here to service. And here are our assets. So let's just create a new asset, which would be an elevator. And let's just go ahead and save that. As you can see, I'm not associating that to an account record at this point in time. 
If I click here on properties, this is where those properties will show up. Now the top one, as you can see, is called current property values and the bottom one is property log history. So the current property values is exactly that, right? It shows all the properties that are current. And if you try to update an existing record in this grid, you will notice that I can't do that. You need to create another record by clicking that button that says new property log over here. You will also notice as soon as you create another property log record with the same property, that newly created record will show in the top grid while that older value drops from the top grid and will only be visible in that history log grid. So you can kind of look at that as a, an audit trail, right? Okay, now let's see how we can actually add that because you're gonna see that if I just try to add it from here, new property log, I don't have a property here yet. So I still first need to add that property to my asset and then I can store data against it. So I'm just gonna go ahead and click here on my related. And let's do that again. And I need to associate it with my asset first. So I'm gonna click on property asset associations. And now I'm going to tie this, the property, to my asset. Just saying that I wanna use that property for this particular asset. To see what we said that was. Counterweight, kilograms, I'm gonna save and close that. So this is where you're gonna select, right, the properties that you're using for this particular asset. So let's also do last service date. Here we go. So these are the properties we will use for this particular asset. So I'm gonna go back to properties and this is where now I can actually pick that property and store data against it. So let's just go ahead and say, we're going to do the counterweight and that is going to be 225 kilograms. So I'm gonna save that and there it is, right? That's my current property value. You can see that it's also in my log history. Now let's add another one. My property is going to be, see if I pick any of the other one, it's not gonna let me. These are the only ones that are available. So last service date was, let's say that is today at, let's just say 10 o'clock. I'm gonna save and close that. Now let's say we actually put in a new service date for tomorrow or a week later. Let's try and do that again. Okay, again, we're gonna do last service date and let's say this is on the 12th at 8 a.m., fine, save and close. So what you'll see now is that my last service date, the old one moved down to my property log history. Right? And in the current property values, we only see that updated one. That's what I was talking about earlier. Now, obviously this could be kind of a drag, right? Having to do that manually, first associate them to the actual asset and then actually add the property values to the asset as well. So there's different ways to actually do this a little bit quicker. So let's go back here to settings. And now let's go here to the templates. So what we can do is we can set up templates. So I'm gonna say elevator. This is my elevator template. And I'm going to, I'm going to add those properties right over here, just like we did earlier, right? Where we said what we wanted to add to the elevator. We said counterweight and we said last service date and let's add some more let's do a make a model as well make here we go and model serial number whatever we'd like save and chart save and close okay now the other thing we can do is we can add asset categories so let's say if we have the asset category that is elevator, which I currently don't have, 
Nope, but let me add that in a second. Okay, let's try that again. Here are the elevators. Save and close. Okay, so what this means is that I can associate this template to a customer asset and it will add all of those properties so I don't have to do it one by one what you guys said, saw earlier. Or I can go and add the category and it will do exactly the same. So let me show you both. Okay, so let's go back to that customer asset, which was the elevator. Here we go. Now, if I look at properties, we have those two fields. And again, if I look at the property asset associations, we have the last service date in a counterweight. So what we can do now is again, we click on relate it and we can go to asset template associations and I can add that template that we just created. Here's my elevator, save and close. Now let's try to add some properties and see what we can do. If I click here on property log, we now see that we have the make and the model as well. So it doesn't duplicate the existing ones, which is great, but it does add, right? These additional ones that we have here as well, which is awesome. All right, let's do another elevator asset. Let's create a new one. Create a new one. Elevator two. Let's go ahead and save that. Right. And you will be able to see that currently I cannot add any properties because there's nothing associated with this asset. Okay. So now I'm going here to my summary tab and I'm going to pick the elevator category that we just associated to that template. Here it is. I'm going to select elevators. I'm going to save that. And those properties should now be copied over. So let's take a look if we can add them now. And here they are. Counterweight, less service date, make a model. Now, this one is not really something that you can really demo, but really what this means is that all of the workflows that we had previously for field service. So for example, to make sure that your agreement data is being processed, right? All of those workflows will now be moved to power automate. So you won't have those workflows basically sucking up the resources in your Dynamics 365 instance. Now, this is actually a setting. So let me show you where you can go ahead and enable this. I'm just going to go back here. Let's close this. Discard my changes. Go here to settings. And we're going to open up the field service settings. Oops, which I already had open. And if you go here to other, This is where you can set this field to use enhanced background processing. So here's another one that's also more to let you guys know that this is happening. I, I wasn't really able to experiment or test with this, but again, I just wanted to mention this because if you're using RSO, which is resource scheduling optimization, this could be an important feature. Now, you probably know that all resources can have one or obviously multiple characteristics or, or skills, whatever you want to call them, associated with resource records. Now, this feature, it kind of enhances RSO as it's going to pick a resource that has the least amount of skills required to complete the work. Now, the reason behind this is that resources that have multiple skills will be available longer for jobs that will need their unique skills. So for example, maybe I have a work order that needs somebody with electrical skills and I'm going to have two resources. I'm going to have Anne and I'm going to have Bill and both of them are available. But Anne has two skills or characteristics. She has, I don't know, electrical and programming and Bill only has the electrical skill. 
what's going to happen is that the system will then pick Bill for the job because Anne has an additional skill that might be utilized for a different job. Here is another one. This one's pretty good as well. So today when you create a work order and when you're populating that customer asset field, the customer asset that is selected in that field actually needs to be related to the service account on that work order. Now, if this is not the case, then you're going to see an error message stating just that, right? And you're not going to be able to actually save that work order like that. But the scenarios that you might have is, you know, you might be you might have the need to associate a customer asset that doesn't belong to the service account to that particular work order. Think about, you know, if, if your company sells equipment that is owned by the company, but maybe it is leased to a different company, right? And maybe then those service accounts would be the ones that actually call you for a work order. In that particular case, that particular customer asset might belong, right, to your account in the system, but you still need to be able to associate that to a particular work order. Or maybe, you know, maybe you're a company that manufactures assets, right? And you might store that information in your field service instance, but maybe you're not tracking the actual service account because maybe your products are being sold by a partner uh, or, or, right? or by distributor, right? So that's when this feature is going to be important. So what does it let us do? It actually lets us turn off those customer asset validations so that now we have the ability to associate a customer asset on a work order that has a different service account than the account of the customer asset. And this is, again, this is just a setting that you can turn on or you can turn off. Now, what kind of goes hand in hand with that is that account reparenting functionality. So again, you can also turn that on or off. And what that means is that the system will take a look at the customer asset account that it's tied to, and it also looks at the service account and on the work order. And if those two are not the same, then you're going to get a pop-up message that is asking you if you want to reparent the account record on the customer assets. Now, what I will do is I will put a link. I will drop that in the comments because Dan Gidler from Microsoft actually recorded a video on that. So I didn't want to repeat that. And on top of that, I didn't see this functionality yet in my preview instance. So I'll drop that link in there as well. And I wanted to mention some additional enhancements as well that are, they were not in early access, so I couldn't really take a look at that, but there's going to be an integration with Dynamics 365 supply chain management. There's also going to be an embedded optimizer within the schedule board. And again, this is for RSO, right? So you can kind of in that schedule board, you're going to be able to see that optimizer because it's going to be sitting right in there. Um, then we're going to have some predictive work duration as well. And what that means is that the actual duration for any booking or requirements is going to be predicted based on various factors. So for example, think about resource performance, think about incident type, customer locations, territories, seasonal changes, etc. So this is really going to be based on AI models, right? And obviously it's going to learn from historical booking completion times to really calculate that duration. Now, according to Microsoft's documentation, it's also going to give a efficiency rating for territories and incident types, again, based on completion times. And so that dispatchers and service managers can actually drill into that information for different technicians across those incident types, right? This is going to help them to more easily identify the right field technician for a particular job uh, or work order. And then lastly, currently it says on the Microsoft website that this is estimated to come out in December 2020. So this is going to 
this is going to help with communication to the customer as well. So what you can do with this technician locator is you're going to be able to schedule. You're going to be able to send service confirmations, notifications to the customer. And then on the day of the service, you're going to be able to send a reminder with a link to track the technician location and their estimated arrival times as well. And then there's going to be a portal application from which customers can actually view their scheduled service details. And also again, that uh, estimated arrival time uh, of their technicians. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. And if you did, please hit that like button. Be sure to check back again next week for another video. Stay safe, everybody, and thanks so much for watching.